share screen. And uh, today we're going to talk about uh, mixture models and uh, uh, the expectation maximization algorithm uh, and how, how they are uh, related uh, and uh, they can provide a more complex variety uh, of uh, probability distributions and how to model uh, these kind of distributions. So uh, first, let's start with what is a mixture model. So uh, we, we say that uh, actually a mixture model uh, uh, is uh, a combination of uh, simpler uh, probability distributions. Uh, and uh, we're going to actually define mixture models by using a, a joint distribution over observed and latent variables. Uh, and uh, we are actually interested only in the uh, distribution of the observed variables. And uh, if we have like a joint distribution of observed and latent variables, uh, the marginal uh, uh, distribution uh, for, for the observed variables can be obtained by applying the sum rule or marginalization. Yeah. So if we have uh, P of X where X is observed and Z, we can always uh, obtain P of X as applying the summation rule, summation over Z out of P of X and Z. So we're going to work with joint distributions of observed and latent variables, but our main goal would be to express complex distributions for the observed variable, and the latent variable is just an artifact that we use uh, if you want, in order to define more complex uh, uh, observed variables, observed distributions, P of X. So this introduction of the latent variables is just a means uh, to be able to uh, model more uh, complicated distributions, which are uh, far from simpler components. Like we'd like uh, the components in the mixture to, to be simple. Uh, like for example, Gaussian distribution, like a mixture of Gaussians that we're going to discuss, or uh, some other exponential uh, distributions. Uh, so one of the first questions that we're going to explore is how can we model a mixture, mixture distribution uh, using uh, discrete latent variables? Uh, and uh, this is what we're going to talk in the first part of the lecture. Uh, just to be clear, like a mixture model is actually a probability distribution, which is a convex combination of other probability distributions. And uh, here we have the definition for a convex combination. So this is a convex function, a convex combination function. Uh, f of uh, x here, uh, and uh, actually what we say, it's a, a weighted combination uh, of uh, uh, some other functions. In our case, these functions should be uh, probability distributions. So in order to have a mixture model, we need to have a combination of uh, probability distributions with specific weights, and uh, in order to have a convex combination, these weights need to respect the following properties. They should be uh, between, uh, each weight should be between zero and one. Uh, and the uh, sum of all, all the weights, like uh, if you want to see like e each individual uh, probability here, it's a component, and the sum of the weights for all the components uh, should be equal to one. Um, cool. and. Uh, like these mixture models, they are used in order to be able to build more complex distributions or to model more complex distributions that arise in the uh, real world. Uh, and there, they are also used for clustering data. Like uh, they are a very good uh, way of clustering data. Uh, and uh, I've told you last time when we talked, like two weeks ago, that uh, one of the mixture models for NLP, uh, which is very used for topic modeling, is called LDA, Latent Dirichlet, uh, Latent Dirichlet Allocation. And it's used for topic modeling, which is actually a way of clustering uh, documents that have the same topic. It's a little bit more complex than that. Uh, maybe you have uh, uh, talked with Professor Troushan at the NLP class, what topic modeling uh, is. Um, um, uh, did you talk with Professor Traushan about topic modeling?
actually I think that you should have done. Um, cool. So uh, LDA uh, is a more complex uh, example of a mixture uh, model. Uh, and uh, if you want, uh, uh, the simplest uh, mixture model is called like uh, the key is provided by the k-means algorithm, which corresponds to a non-probabilistic limit of uh, the expectation maximization algorithm applied to a mixture of Gaussian. So, uh, for uh, a mixture of Gaussian where we don't have any probabilities, uh, the, uh, or uh, we have some uh, Gaussians with specific, uh, we're going to see at the end of the class with specific conditions. Uh, we, we get to the simple k-means algorithms. And actually, we're going to start from it. So before going into mixture models, let's start uh, with, with uh, uh, a quick recap of what k-means does. So k-means, it's an algorithm used for clustering. So given that we have a set of observations, uh, xn, so we have n observations. These observations are in a, a specific space, let's say a d-dimensional space. Uh, and we want to partition this data set into a number of, class, of, of clusters, and we know the number of clusters, we, we know that we want k clusters. Uh, and this value is given. Uh, and what's a cluster actually, uh, because we didn't talk about clustering, but I'm sure that you discussed this with uh, Professor uh, Radulescu at uh, data mining in the first semester. Actually, clustering is a way, it's a way of grouping together data points that have uh, uh, small uh, interpoint distances in the same uh, cluster compared to distances uh, for points which are from different clusters. Uh, so intercluster distances are small uh, and intra, uh, so, yeah, uh, between cluster distances should be higher. Uh, and it's a way of doing unsupervised learning. Uh, and uh, actually how k-means works and how clustering wor some clustering algorithm work not only k-means, uh, but a wider set. We actually uh, introduce a set uh, of k uh, vectors in this d-dimensional space, which are actually like uh, the center of the centers or centroids of the clusters. And we say they are defined by mu k uh, from now on. So mu k will be the center or the centroid of the k's cluster. Uh, and uh, we'd like to find an assignment for each data point to, uh, to, to only one cluster. So each data point will be assigned to only one cluster. So it's a hard assignment compared to a soft one where you have probabilities. Uh, so that the sum of the squares of the distances from each point to the closest uh, centroid should be minimum. So uh, Actually, uh, the measure that you're going to use is called the distortion me measure, which is our objective function, uh, like how good the clustering is, uh, is defined by using the square of the distance between uh, each point xn and the closest cluster. Uh, the cluster that, uh, so the closest cl cluster is actually the cluster for which each point is assigned to. So we take this distance from, uh, for each point as the closest cluster, uh, and uh, here we have R and K. So R and K is actually a one uh, uh, hot one out of K or one hot encoding uh, uh, for each point. So for each point Xn, we have one hot encoding R, R and K for, uh, for the assignment of this specific point to, to a cluster. Um, so if it's one hot encoding, it means that it has K values but only one of these k values is equal to one, and all the other ones is equal to zero. And it's equal to one only for the value uh, where the current point xn is assigned to uh, to that specific cluster. Yeah. So uh, here the distortion measure, which is actually the sum uh, for all the, the distances uh, to the closest cluster. So here we have a sum. Uh, it's a double summation from n going to or from one to k, uh, to one to n, and k going from one to k. Here we have uh, r and k, but actually what's important for each value n, only one uh, element in this uh, uh, vector is equal uh, to, to to one. Uh, and the objective objective is to find the uh, encoding for r and k, uh, so which is a cluster uh, for each point uh, n, uh, and also the centroids, the best centroids, in order to minimize, so this is, uh, 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 here we have a distance, so we actually want to minimize this distance, or this error. Um, cool, 
So, uh, and how does it work? Now we start with some initial uh, values for mu k. This could be uh, uh, random values, or uh, they could be assigned to points uh, uh, in, in the set of points that we have. And then we repeat until we uh, uh, converge, and we'll see what convergence means. Uh, two steps. Uh, the first step is called uh, expectation. We minimize the error with respect to R and K by keeping the centroids uh, fixed. So we keep the centroids fixed, and we want to find the best assignments uh, of the points to these centroids. Uh, and then, knowing the assignments that we have computed in the previous step, we keep these assignments fixed. And we compute uh, the new uh, centroids of the clustering. So uh, this is called the maximization step. So you see what, what actually happens uh, if you want the parameters, the parameters of the model. In our case, are mu k because we only have the centers of the cluster. So mu k are the parameters of the model and. What, what actually k-means does, first it says, keeping the parameters fixed, like the all parameters, we want to find the best assignments uh, that explain uh, uh, these parameters. And then having the assignments, the best assignments for this step, we want to update our parameters, in our case the centroids, uh, in order to get in the next step to a better assignment. And we're going to do this uh, repeatedly until uh, we reach convergence. Uh, and if you want, this uh, k-means algorithm can be seen as a very simple variant of the expectation maximization algorithm that we're going to talk about uh, in the uh, lecture, during the lecture. Um, cool, and now let's go for the expectation step. So in the expectation step, we keep, uh, so we keep mu k fixed, and we want to determine r and k. And we see that j is a linear combination of these values r and k, and for different points n, these values are independent, therefore we can uh, optimize for each point n uh, separately of the other points. Uh, and uh, actually we see that we have a distance that we want to minimize, uh, and because we have a distance that, that we want to minimize, and uh, due to the fact that r and k is actually uh, one hot encoding, uh, then we should put this value equal to one for the minimum distance that we have. So for each point n, we need to put it to the mini minimum distance. So to the closest, the minimum distance is the one that we have to the closest centroid. So we compute the distance for all the centroids, uh, all the centroids j, and we uh, put this value r and k to one uh, for the closest centroid. And for all the other ones, we put it equal to zero uh, because we need to have a correct uh, one uh, out of k uh, encoding. Um, cool, so actually this uh, expectation step says for each point, uh, just put the value to one uh, for the closest centroid and zero for all the other centroids. Uh, and then in the uh, maximization step, in the maximization step, we keep uh, R and K fixed, the ones that we have just computed. And we need to determine the uh, new values for uh, the parameters of the uh, clustering, for mu K in our case. Uh, and uh, actually we observe that uh, here we have, it's a quadratic function of mu k, therefore we need to compute the de derivative, so two goes in front, uh, so it's uh, uh, two goes in front, and we're gonna have something like this, so sum over all the point out of r and k uh, multiplied with xn minus mu k. Uh, and actually this is very simple to compute the solution, the solution would be uh, mu k, like the new centroids, will be a summation for all the points out of R and K multiplied with Xn divided by R and K. And actually now to interpret a bit, what we have here on the denominator, uh, denominator, it's actually the number of points in cluster K. So this summation will only take the ones for the, point, uh, for the points which are assigned to cluster K. If the current point N is not assigned to uh, cluster K, the value will be gonna be a value of zero. So here we're gonna have the number of points in cluster K. And here, as a numerator, as a numerator, we actually uh, have, uh, uh, we're going to have the summation for each coordinate. So we have a D coordinate. So for each coordinate individual, we're going to have the summation on this specific coordinate only for the points which are assigned in cluster K. Uh, so uh, this is why we actually, what happens here, we compute the mean for each coordinate, like for each dimension, 
uh, would compute the mean uh, only for the points xn which are assigned to cluster k. And it's actually like the arith arithmetic mean. Uh, and this is why it's called k means clustering. k because we know we are given the number of uh, clusters, it's equal to k, we need to uh, have th this from the beginning. And then means because uh, actually at each step in the maximization step, uh, each centroid is going to have the for each, each centroid for each dimension is going to have the mean value of the points assigned to the specific cluster for the specific di dimension. Well, and actually, it's a very simple algorithm. You see, it, it's, uh, we have very simple formulas. It's very easy to implement it. Uh, what does it mean to converge? So when do we stop? We stop when uh, after two assignments. Uh, 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 sorry, after two uh, successive steps, uh, the two assignments are the same, so they do, do not change. Or if this doesn't happen uh, uh, fast enough, uh, so it takes too much much time uh, in order to reach uh, to reach convergence, uh, like not changing, then we stop uh, after a maximum number of steps. Uh, and or another uh, way of stopping is when the value of j, so of the uh, error, uh, decreases uh, very little at the current step. So we can put a threshold in order to so to see when uh, this value decreases. So it still decreases, it still improves, but it, it decreases too little. Um, cool. And actually, it's guaranteed that uh, this the algorithm will converge maybe after many steps but it will converge but the problem is that it, it will converge to a local rather than a global minimum of, of the error so it's not guaranteed to find the global minimum of the error and actually what you should do you should run KME several times uh, with different clusters at the beginning uh, in, in order to see which is like the optimum uh, the, like the, optimum, the best ones that you can find it's still not guaranteed to be a global but you, you'll be able to pick out of several local optimums uh, the one that uh, is slightly better. Uh, and this is for uh, the uh, data sets. This is the old geyser data set. So it's a data set with eruptions from a geyser, like how much uh, time does it take and so on. Uh, and uh, we have two dimensions here. And uh, uh, we start uh, at the beginning with two random uh, values for the centroids, like these two ones, the red and the uh, blue crosses. Uh, and in the first step expectation, we assign each point to the closest cluster. Uh, and uh, you see like the red points are assigned to the red cluster, uh, uh, the blue points to the uh, blue cross. Uh, and in the, so this is expectation, this is maximization. In the maximization step, we compute the new value for the uh, centroids. So we compute new crosses, like new blue cross, new red cross, and then we continue again expectation, maximization, expectation, maximization, and so on and so forth. And for this example, after a few, num a few number of steps, on, after four steps, uh, you see like the error decreases, decreases, and uh, then uh, yeah, it converges. Uh, for more complex data sets uh, and like larger number of clusters, it's not so easy. Uh, as improvements, there have been several improvements, like uh, we're going to see on the next slide the K-medioids. There is also like K-means plus plus, which has a be better assignment of the uh, initial uh, centroids, of the initial new case. So first, the first uh, improvement uh, was to look at how uh, the initial uh, values for the uh, centroids uh, are picked uh, the best, like in order to have uh, better clustering or a better convergence. Uh, is, and uh, it could be picked to a random subset of the k data points, so you just pick randomly some points. Uh, uh, and k means plus plus actually uh, does a little bit better. Like uh, you could like why to pick randomly when you can pick like maybe from uh, the distribution, like uh, better compute the distribution and take this into account. Um, okay, but some other things that can be improved, uh, like the expectation step. In the expectation step, we need to compute each time the distance between each data point and each centroid or cluster prototype vector, each mu k. Uh, and one, uh, may, maybe a, a better way is to improve this computation. Uh, uh, and uh, another thing that we can do is to have like an online, online algorithm, so uh, to to, to learn uh, as new data points arise. And for the online algorithm, what, what happens like for each new point that we have, so if we have a new point Xn, uh, we take uh, the closest cluster and uh, we're going to take the distance between Xn and the closer cluster 
and we, we're going to update the, the close this cluster mu k uh, by taking something similar to uh, 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 like a learning ratio. Um, uh, cool. Uh, and uh, another improvement would be so k means uh, uses hard assignments, so R and K is hard, it's either one or, or zero. Another improvement would be to use soft assignments, and we're going to see that this is exactly what the expectation maximization algorithm does. It uses soft assignments. Uh, and then another improvement is like the key metroids. The key metroid says instead of using like the distance, Euclidean distance, maybe in some uh, spaces, Euclidean distance is not very good, like especially if we have like in NLP, where we have a sparse, if you use the bag of words representation, we have like a sparse uh, representation, a sparse space. Maybe it's a better way to use like cosine similarity instead of uh, Euclidean distance. Uh, and here we say we just, uh, uh, if, if we want to use another similarity measure or dissimilarity measure, uh, new, uh, maybe computing this measure is more complex, and uh, therefore in the M step it will be more complex and uh, to compute it. And the way to do it is like to uh, restrict the centroids to be actually the closest point uh, to the actual centroid, like to be one of the points in the, the set that, that you have, and then you can just compute the similarity between these points. Uh, like, for example, in NLP, it's simple to compute the cosine similarity between any two documents. Um, cool. And like, there have been several applications, even for k-means. Uh, one of them is like for image segmentation and compression. The simplest way would be like image uh, binarization. Uh, and for example, what we have here, like we have an original image, and what we do, like for, uh, for like for each point. Here we want to find uh, a subset of k. Uh, uh, we, we want to find a subset of uh, uh, k clusters such that uh, each point, uh, each point based on the color on the RGB from the original image is going to be assigned to uh, uh, to one of the to the cluster which is most similar to. Uh, so uh, actually, here when k is equal to two, we're going to have image uh, bina binarization. Uh, uh, and then for key, k equal to 3 or k equal to uh, 10 and so on, we could have maybe a better uh, kind of segmentation. Uh, of course, it's not like the uh, semantic segmentation that uh, you have seen uh, in, uh, in, in, in computer vision, uh, because uh, it's still unsupervised, so it's a clustering. Uh, cool, so this would be like a binarization, binarization of images or segmentation. Uh, and then it could be even for image compression, because imagine instead of uh, now if you send instead of sending the original image, now what you need to send, you're going to send K RGB points, so K RGB values, K colors. Uh, and then for each uh, pixel, you're just going to put uh, the ID of the uh, of the cluster is uh, it is part of. Yeah. So instead of having uh, for each pixel a color. Now for each pixel you have the value, uh, uh, the value of the cluster. Uh, and of course the number of colors is mu much larger than for here, for example, k uh, uh, clusters. Um, cool. Of course this compression is uh, lossy. Like uh, if we uh, compress the image, we cannot decompress it uh, uh, again. Um, Cool. So this is key means, and now let's go into the main part of the class. So we said we're going to talk about mixture of Gaussians. Uh, so we're going to just take a linear combination, a linear superposition of uh, Gaussian uh, distribution of probabilities, uh, which will allow us to actually build more complex probability distributions by using a simple uh, uh, distribution, like the Gaussian distribution. Uh, and we would like to see how we can express the Gaussian mixture. So this is called Gaussian mixture model, GMM. We can also find it in scikit-learn. Uh, and uh, we're going to see how we can express it using uh, latent variables. And it's going to serve as the motivation uh, uh, on how the expectation uh, maximization algorithm arises for uh, mixture models. Yeah. So this is, so we say, 
the mixture of Gaussians is a, a weighted combination of uh, k different uh, uh, individual Gaussians. Yeah. Uh, where pk, uh, they are called the mix mixing coefficients, like we mix together uh, uh, the, the Gaussians, and pk are called the mixing coefficients. And, and now we're going to, so this is how we define like the mixture of Gaussians. And now we want to express this mixture of Gaussians, like how can we add a latent variable uh, like z or zk uh, with k values, one value for each uh, for, for, for each uh, Gaussian in the mix mixture. And we say that we can do it by adding uh, a, a discrete uh, random variables with, with k states. Uh, so uh, we're going to use a one hot encoding for z. So z is a multinomial distribution, one hot, one hot encoded. Uh, one value, uh, so we're going to have set, uh, uh, zk. Uh, for zk, uh, only one value is equal to one, and all the other ones are equal to zero. Uh, and now the joint distribution, we're going to work with the joint distribution, which is P of X and Z. So X is the observed, uh, it's uh, the mixture of Gaussians, and now Z is uh, these latent variables, uh, multinomial that we have just introduced. Um, and of course, we can express that P of X and Z is P of X given Z multiplied with P of Z. So uh, the Bayesian network is very simple. Uh, X uh, is uh, conditioned on Z. Uh, and uh, because it's a mixture distributions and the distribution, of course, we can, uh, we, we already know the parameters of the, of, of the multinomial. So mu K are the parameters of the multinomial. They define, they have all the properties we need, like they are between zero and one, they are correct probability values, and th their summation is equal to one, so uh, it's a correct uh, distribution probability. Uh, and uh, th these values pk, I've told you, they are called the mixing coefficients, and they are actually the marginal distribution over z. So marginal distribution is when uh, you have a joint and you get one uh, the other variables out. So the marginal distribution over z is when you get x out over here, and actually p of zk equal to 1, the marginal distribution of z is actually p pk. So it's a mixing coefficient. So how probable is, is for us to pick the k case Gaussian? This is uh, how you should interpret it. So pk is how important is the case Gaussian in the uh, in the mixture of Gaussians? Uh, and so this is like the marginal p of uh, z. Uh, but I would like to see which is a marginal distribution for x, like because the marginal distribution of x is a mixture of Gaussians. This is a mixture of Gaussians. And uh, now we're going to write, so P of Z, it's a multinomial distribution. You have already seen that multinomial distributions can be written like this. So P of Z, it's, uh, it's a product over all the K states out of uh, the uh, mixing uh, coefficients pau Z, pau ZK. Uh, and how you interpret it is that uh, the probability of ZK being in state, state K it's actually equal just to zk because only uh, uh, just to pk. So the probability uh, of zk being equal to one, it's actually pk. This is what I'm saying. So and we, so if zk is equal to one, we only get pk because for all the other uh, values pi uh, with i different from k, uh, zk is going to be equal to zero and uh, uh, you're going to have, uh, uh, so imagine it's going to be something like this, P1 pi 0 multiplied with P2 pi 0, and so on and so forth. Somewhere here you have PK pi 1, and so on and so forth, until you have P, uh, this is smaller K, this is upper K pi 0. And this is why you only remain, we only remain with PK pi 1, because for all the other values, so we're going to have PK pi 0. Uh, cool, and now let's see what happens. So, if we condition uh, uh, the mixture of Gaussians and we know which component we pick from, so P of X, we condition the mixture of Gaussians, given that K is equal to 1. This means that we know that we sample from the case Gaussian, then it's actually uh, the probability, the Gaussian distribution K. Uh, cool, and now if we don't know what we sample from, if we say P of X 
given z, p of x given z is actually a product out of uh, uh, each Gaussian power uh, zk. Um, cool, and now we'd like to write the marginal. Now the marginal makes use of this, of what we have above. The marginal, it's actually a summation over p of x and z. Yeah, like it's a summation over the joint. Uh, probability and we use this uh, Bayesian network p of x and z it's actually p of x given z p of x given z multiplied with p of z um, uh, cool and now we just write we look, look what we have over here so it's actually a summation out of pk uh, multiplied with uh, the, uh, the case Gaussian distribution um, Cool. Uh, so actually, how you should interpret this is, is like it's a summation. Uh, it's a summation out of this value. So th it's this value that we have over here. So it's uh, the values that you get for z k being in state uh, for z k being equal to one or z being uh, in state one. And p k it's uh, the probability for z k being equal to one. So this is how you should interpret this. So actually, this is how we get. So uh, the latent variable is actually uh, ca can be seen as being incorporated in the mixture of Gaussians, even if you don't see it from the beginning. Um, cool. Uh, and uh, now we see, okay, the marginal distribution of X uh, for the, the joint uh, probability that we have, it's a Gaussian mixture. And now let's assume, let's consider that we have several observations, x1, xn, and so on, uh, from this marginal distribution, uh, from this mi mixture of Gaussian. So we get several samples from the, uh, uh, from the mixture model. Uh, and uh, for each observed data point, for each xn, actually we should have uh, a latent variable zn. The latent variables Zn would tell us which is the uh, corresponding Gaussian from which we sample from. Uh, and like if we if we would know which is the latent uh, variables that we sample from, we would have an advantage of working with this joint probability instead of P of X. So P of X is a mixture of Gaussian, it's a more complex distribution, it's not exponential. Uh, it's a mixture, it's a summation of exponentials. But this one could be simpler to work with. Like, and we're going to see what simpler means. Simpler means that the logarithm will act, act on a product. Here, for P of X, we're going to see in a few slides, the logarithm doesn't, uh, uh, when we use log likelihood, the logarithm uh, is not acting uh, on a product. It's acting on, on, on a summation. Cool. Now, we say, uh, so uh, given the fact that the mixture of, mixture of Gaussians can be expressed using these latent variables, it means that at least from uh, a theoretical point of view, each point xn has a corresponding value zn, a corresponding latent variable. But actually, this latent variable, it, it, we don't know it because the, observ like the observations are only the points xn. We don't know the latent variables. It would be great to know them, but we don't know them. And what we can find out, we can find out gamma of zn k uh, which is called the responsibility for the case Gaussian to explain observation X, like one of the points that we have just observed. And uh, what uh, is the definition? Definition of gamma of ZK, it's actually the posterior probability, uh, the posterior probability for a Gaussian, like for ZK being equal to one for the latent variable, given that we have just observed uh, a, a new point. Uh, and here we apply like the base, we apply base theorem. So this is base theorem. Uh, and actually applying base theorem, he, he, now here we have it's P of ZK uh, equal to one, multiplied with the reverse of this P of X given ZK equal to one. And here as the denominator, we have P of X. So here is a denominator. We actually have the, uh, we divide by the mixture of Gaussians that we uh, already know. Um, cool. Uh, and actually what we get, we get to the fact that the uh, responsibility, uh, and actually the responsibility, what is? It's a value that we have how much the keys component is responsible. So how much value the keys component uh, uh, gets 
the value is a, uh, is a mixing coefficient multiplied with the actual uh, value of the distribution uh, for this point x, divided by the uh, value that we have for the sum over uh, all the Gaussians, like for, for the mixture model. So how much weight uh, the case Gaussian provides from the mixture of Gaussians, from all the Gaussians? This is how you should interpret it. And uh, this is like uh, the responsibility or how much of the point X it's explained by the case Gaussian. And of course, we have uh, K Gaussians and each uh, Gaussian will have a responsibility. Um, cool. Uh, and now imagine what actually happens. So this would be, this is called, we're going to see the complete data set. So this is a complete data set. These are actually values uh, for both X and Z. So in the complete data set, it would be like the uh, best case that we could have, like the imaginary case where we are given not only the observations. So here these points are the observations from the mixture of Gaussians, but we are actually given also the mixing coefficients. Uh, like, like we are given the value for the multinomial Z. And uh, here in this case, the value for the multinomials are like for the red component, P of red is equal to dot five, P of green is equal to dot three, and P of blue is equal to dot two. This is how you should interpret. And these values P are actually defining Z, our multinomial. Uh, cool, so what we say over here, we say in the complete data set for each point, not only that we know the value of the point, we know X, so these are the value of the points X, but we also know its color. Its color means which is a Gaussian that generated this point. And you see that here we have, this is generated by the red component, even if this point would have been more probably generated by the green one because it's closer to the mean of the green component. So this is a complete data set, but in real world, what we get, we get incomplete data set. Incomplete data set. For the incomplete data set, it means that for each point Xn, so here we have Xn and Zn. Uh, here for the incomplete data set means that we only have the observations. We have Xn, the observations. So you see everything is in pink. We don't know which of the Gaussian components uh, have provided each point. And again, here we don't know which are the corresponding Gaussian. We just know the summation. So here these are the, the three Gaussians, the, the three distribution uh, probabilities that we have on the left. They are summed up. And we only know, like here we have a maximum from this one. Here it's a, another maximum because we sum up uh, the red and the uh, green component. And he, here we have an, again another maximum. Like if you want, and if you want to look in 3D, like this is in 2D, like a hot point. Uh, if you look in 3D, here we have this maximum and that we have, uh, like this would be the, uh, how the distribution looks like. Uh, cool, so this is Xn, and actually what we say over here, so in real world, we, uh, we ideally would, would be, so this is the ideal. We don't have this. In real world, what we can compute, this is in reality. In reality, we can compute gamma of uh, Xn. Uh, gamma of Xn and Zk. So we can, what we can compute for each point Xn, we can compute gamma of Xn and Zk. Like for each point Xn, which is the corresponding responsibility? So for each point, which is gamma of Nk, which is uh, the responsibility. And you see, this responsibility, it's actually like a soft assignment. For, for example, for points that we have over here, the responsibility, it's a mix between red and green, which means that it's like if you want half red and half green or part red and part, part green. Uh, for the points that we have here, it's uh, on, only red or, or the red component is like 99.9%. But actually, this responsibility acts like a soft assignment. So you see, each point now is not assigned to a cluster perfectly like we have over here. So if in the ideal situation, we would have like a perfect assignment, a hard assignment. But in the real world, we cannot compute this hard assignment, and we can only compute the responsibilities which uh, act like a soft assignment for each point Xn, like uh, to each uh, uh, Gaussian component. 
Uh, and now we'd like to see how maximum likelihood. So we have a mission. We know that we uh, have these points XN sampled uh, from the same distribution, uh, but they are independent. So it's IID data. Uh, and we'd like to compute which are the parameters of the model. So uh, which are uh, the parameters in our case? Uh, usually parameters are theta, and in our case would be the mixing coefficients, the means, and the covariances for each Gaussian. Um, cool. And now what we say, well, like we have uh, uh, n observations. Uh, this matrix X is going to be like the metric matrix with all these observations in a d-dimensional space. Uh, and then we're also going to have uh, a matrix Z for all the latent variables. And uh, again, we're going to have n latent variables in the k-dimensional space for how many Gaussians we have. Uh, cool. And now what actually happens, this is a Bayesian network right now. We say, so again, we have n components. So each component was x given z, and we have n components of this type. Uh, the observed variable is xn, so xns are, are given, and zn uh, is latent. Uh, and which are the parameters? The, para hyper the parameters of the models right here, uh, they are with dots, as we have seen, are p, mu, and uh, covariances. Uh, cool. Uh, so the log likelihood function now uh, for all the so these are the observations. This is uh, x uh, is uh, the set of all the observations, and we compute the log likelihood of all the observations, giving like this is the set of p. It's all the mixing coefficients. Like if you want p, it's an array uh, out of p1 up to pk, and so on here mu. It's an array, and sigma is an array of covariance matrices. Uh, cool. And actually, what happens now? Now it's a log likelihood. It's similar to log likelihood, other log likelihood uh, functions that we have computed. And actually, what happens when we have this log likelihood? Uh, so we have k, we have n independent points. Therefore, uh, we're going to have a log uh, a logarithm of a product over all the points. And the logarithm was a product transformed into a summation of logarithms. But now the, but, but now the probability, it's a mixture of Gaussians. So you see the probability, it's a summation of Gaussians with some uh, missing coefficients in front. So the main problem that we have right now, we're going to see is that now the logarithm, so why did we use log likelihood? We use log likelihood because we said lo the logarithm should apply directly on the uh, exponential family, including Gaussian distributions. So the logarithm should apply directly on the uh, Gaussian distribution. But as you see here, the logarithm now is applied on a summation. So cannot go uh, logarithm of a summation is something complex. Uh, we, we can is not logarithm of a product in order to to work uh, fast and easy. So this is, this is, is going to be the main problem, but until we, so we, we still don't know how to solve it, but uh, uh, we're going to look uh, at it closely. But before solving it, we have some other problem. Now, let's assume we have a mixture of two Gaussians. You see, we have a mixture of two Gaussians, uh, two one dimensional Gaussians, like they are one dimensional. So X and one dimensional Gaussian. And here is the first one. The mean is somewhere over here. And here is the second one. And the mean of the second Gaussian it's actually uh, the same value as one of the points here, xn. So these are the points x1, x2, and so on and so forth, xn. These are the points, uh, uh, the observations that we are given. And the main problem is that for the second Gaussian, xn, it's actually equal to mu2, the mean of the second Gaussian in our case. So when, actually when this happens, so, uh, when this is called a singularity, uh, and when what does the singularity mean? It, it means that uh, when one of the uh, observations of the point xn col is called collapses, or it's equal to one of the means of the Gaussians, in our case mu2, let's say the second Gaussian, uh, imagine what happens if we have a very simple covariance matrix, uh, which only has, uh, uh, like, it's going to be the identity matrix multiplied with, uh, 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 like, sigma, like a variance value. So what, what happens if uh, Xn is equal 
to uh, see if xn is equal to uh, uj to one of the means of the Gaussians, what happens, uh, it happens that the value for that Gaussian, uh, so this is Gaussian j, yeah, uh, the value for this Gaussian j for point xn, given that uh, here xn appears two times, but it's correct, because for the second time when it appears, it appears instead of the mean. So the, uh, the probability of xn given the mean equal to xn and the fact that we have a very simple covariance matrix, uh, which is identity matrix multiplied with a simple variance, uh, is going to look something like this. So it's going to be 1 divided by 2p under the uh, square root multiplied with 1 divided uh, out of this value, uh, the variance sigma g. Uh, because what happens here, you, we would have had x of something, but this x, uh, x of something was e to x power something that was xn minus mu j multiplied with something. And xn minus mu j now is equal to 0. So it's e power 0 and it fades away. So this exponent, x e power something fades away because it will be e power 0. And uh, actually, imagine what happens. So what the only thing that uh, remains is this value. And we want to we want to maximize the product of the, these probabilities. So we want to maximize the product of these probabilities. Can you tell me what happens, like which is the simplest way to maximize the product of these probabilities? So what happens if this variance uh, sigma j for this component goes to zero, what does it mean the variance goes to zero? How, how does the uh, the Gaussian distribution looks like if the variance is equal to zero? It will look something like this. It's called like a Dirac impulse. So the value is going to be zero for everything except for the, the mean, which is like xn equal to mu j, and here is going to be infinity. So th this is how, instead of having a nice Gaussian, actually what will have it will transform into a Dirac impulse where everything is going to be zero except for this value where it will go to infinity. Uh, cool, so actually for this point, the value will go to infinity, and now what we'll do, we'll multiply infinity with these values, which are given, which are uh, like probabilities between zero and one, and they are given by the, the, the other Gaussian, uh, Gaussian functions that we have. So we're going to multiply with infinity with some other values and it will go, the log likelihood will go to infinity. And this is a maximum value that we can get. So we cannot get anything higher than infinity. So it would seem that the, the best thing the, Gaussian, uh, the Gaussians can do would be to overfit one of the values in the data set. But this is not what we want to do. This would be like overfitting. So this is called the singularity and it's something that we don't want to, uh, to happen. Uh, and like uh, we're going to see how we can solve it. But first, let's see if we would, would have had only one Gaussian. So why doesn't this happen if we have only one Gaussian? So maximum likelihood for the Gaussian function, like the beginning of the class. If we only have one Gaussian, why doesn't this happen? Why, why don't we have this singularity problem? Like if we have several, if we only have one Gaussian, and if this would collapse, so xn would be equal to the only Gaussian to mu1. This value would be equal to infinity, of course, but for all the, all the other points, like for x1, x2, the value would be equal to zero. So actually, when you compute the maximum likelihood, we're going to have one infinity, but we're going to have n minus one zeros. And yeah, it's not very, uh, very mathematical, but you, if you multiply zero n minus one times with infinity only once, one time, uh, this will go to zero and not, not to infinity. So uh, like this would be the explanation, explanation on short, like it's not for mathematicians, it's more of like for computer scientists. 
So if we only have one Gaussian, this can, cannot happen because uh, for z, z point, of course, the probability will be infinity, but for all the other ones, if, if we only have one Gaussian, the probability will be equal to zero, and actually the log likelihood will go to zero and not to infinity. So this only happens if we have at least two Gaussian components. So it only happens for a mixture, mixture of Gaussians. Um, cool, and now we need to uh, detect, so what we should do? Uh, can, can't we apply a mixture of Gaussian models? Yes, we can uh, apply it, but we, we, we need to be able to discover if we have these uh, singularities. So if we detect that one of the Gaussian is collapsing, what it means is collapsing, its, its mean is very close to one of the data points, uh, we will reset it. W what does it mean to reset it? We will change the mean to a random mean, uh, like si similar to the initialization when we choose a random point, and uh, each covariance to, uh, to some uh, large value. So why we need to also change the covariance matrix? Because actually, if this has happened, the covariance has shifted in order to, to have uh, like uh, to have a very small variance. And this is why we we change the covariance matrix to large values because the values now worth more. And then we continue with the optimization. So it's very simple. If this happens, we need to uh, change the mean uh, to a random value and the covariance to some larger numbers. Uh, cool. And uh, now that we, so we, we know that we can we can apply maximum likelihood, but actually the problem with applying maximum likelihood right now is the one that I have already told you. The logarithm is not directly applied on the exponential on the normal distribution. Now it's applied on the summation. So this is a problem over here. The logarithm now it's applied on the summation and not, not on the exponential uh, that we have over here in the distribution. Therefore, we cannot compute uh, the solution easily. So if we, uh, we, if we just compute like the derivative, uh, it will uh, not, not be so simple. And now we have to to to, to variance the variance that we discuss in order to compute is called the expect uh, like the variance that we choose to discuss is called the expectation maximization algorithm, although there are some other optimization techniques. So now we get like to uh, the main part of the class expectation maximization for Gaussian mixtures. So we first discuss this algorithm for Gaussian mixtures. Then we generalize it for any uh, or for most uh, uh, models, mixtures, mo mixture models with latent variables. So what what so is EM? EM it's an algorithm which is powerful in order to find maximum likelihood solutions for uh, models that have latent variables, uh, not only observations. Uh, on the other hand, it, might, well, it has a larger applicability for probabilistic uh, uh, graphical models, but uh, this is the first way to introduce it uh, in the context of Gaussian mixture models. So, um, let's re like uh, what we say, say here, let's recap what happens. So, the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution looks something like this. And actually, when we compute the derivative, with respect to mu k, so we said it's more complex to compute the derivative now uh, with respect to each uh, uh, each parameter to mu k, uh, sigma k, and p k, but we can still do it. So we can compute the derivative, but because we have the logarithm over here, we need to. Uh, so because we have the logarithm, we need to derivate the logarithm as well, and this is actually what we have done. Which is the derivative of the logarithm? It's one over the, the function inside the logarithm, and this is what we have over here. So it's one over the function. And then when we compute the derivative with respect to mu k, uh, actually what we get when we compute the derivative, pk will stay in front. Like for, for all the other values uh, with i different than k, they go away because they don't depend on uh, mu k, and only for uh, the case Gaussian, we're going to keep, uh, we're going to have something over here. And we have pk, we also have the uh, Gaussian, uh, uh, because e power x derivative is e power x, uh, but we need to also uh, derivate uh, the x, the f of x that we have here. Uh, and we, when we compute the derivative here, we're going to have like it's uh, sigma k, uh, 
the covariance multiplied with xn minus mu k. Uh, cool. So this is what we get. It's not so uh, is, like it's not so complex. Uh, and what we can observe over here uh, is the fact that here we actually have the responsibility of the keys Gaussian uh, for the endpoint. So it's uh, gamma of Z and K. Uh, and uh, in order to compute the value for mu K, the simplest thing to do is to multiply it by the reverse of the covariance matrix on each part. Here we have zero, so it doesn't have uh, happened anything. And on the right part, when we multiply uh, with the reverse, the reverse of the matrix multiplied with the matrix, they fade away. They are equal to uh, one if you want, well, uh, the identity matrix. Therefore, actually, we, here we will only have like mu k, it's one over n k, where one over n k is the summation of, of all the responsibilities for all the points for the current Gaussian, like for uh, component k. So it's one over n k multiplied with uh, uh, the responsibility of point n uh, for the current component k multiplied with xn. Uh, cool. And the first question that arises uh, would be, uh, is this formula similar to something we have seen in, in the current class? What do you say? The formula from K means? Yeah, it's very similar to the formula from similar to formula from K means. The formula for K means for computing mu K, the new parameters, which is the only difference. It's only one difference. Here we have this responsibility. This responsibility is a probability, yeah. And uh, here for uh, k means, what did we have instead of gamma of, of z and k? We had the hard assignment. We had r of n k, the hard assignment, like which is the closest uh, cluster. Uh, and of course, this happens everywhere. So everywhere we have gamma. Even here, we, we also had uh, r of n k. So the only the only difference uh, when we compute the, 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 the like you mentioned the means of the Gaussians are similar to the centroids of the clusters no because in, in the centroids of a cluster are, would be the same here uh, like the mean is a centroid of a Gaussian if you want uh, so computing the means of the Gaussian is, is the same as computing the centroids of the cluster but because we don't know the correct assignment we don't know R and K we use the prob the soft assignment uh, uh, given by the responsibilities. And uh, actually, even for k means, we don't know the correct assignment. So it's not a bad way that to use soft assignments. Yeah, like it's maybe it's a good way, the, the fact that we use a soft assignment, because we are not so, uh, we are not saying this point has been generated by the case cluster alone. We say, okay, at this point, some of them seem to be generated more by uh, one component with probability closer to one, but these ones were not pretty sure. They are somewhere in between, so uh, they should account for uh, both components or for several components. So it's a pretty smart thing that we use these probabilities like soft. These are soft or probabilities. And these are hard assignments or one out of k assignments. Um, cool. Uh, can you tell me how how you how you would interpret this value n k? Expected number of points. Yeah, it'd be like expected number of points. The posterior expected number of points uh, in uh, that was generated by the case Gaussian. No. Um, Cool, it's a good a good definition. So we can interpret it n k like the expected or effective num number of points assigned to cluster k. Even if we don't have a hard assignment, we keep like uh, uh, soft assignments. Uh, 
Cool, and like the solution would be like for the keys Gaussian, we take like a weighted mean of all the points in the data set where the weights are given like by how certain we are that that point uh, is uh, generated by the keys Gaussian. If a point is not, uh, we are pretty certain that it is not generated by this Gaussian, by the keys Gaussian, uh, we won't take into account uh, that value. So the weighting factor is given by this responsibility. And uh, actually this is pretty cool. And another thing that we should observe over here is the fact that this value for mu k is very similar to the value for for only for the expected uh, sorry for the maximum likelihood for only one Gaussian. If we have had only one Gaussian, do you remember which is a formula only for one Gaussian? Mu maximum likelihood only for one Gaussian. Only for one Gaussian, mu maximum likelihood it's one over n, a summation over all the points x n. Yeah. Maybe mu maximum likelihood for only one Gaussian, it's a one over n, all the points that we have, out of summation out of x n with n going from one to n. Yeah, so you see there is a clear resemblance. So instead of having all the points n, we only have the points which are uh, assigned, let's say, to Gaussian uh, uh, k. And if, instead of using all the points uh, uh, here as an average, like when we compute the mean, uh, we have a weighted average. We have this weighted average which takes into account how much the current point is probably generated by uh, uh, this uh, current component, the case component. Yeah, And actually this is what happens also for the uh, covariance ma uh, matrix. So each covariance matrix is in a similar way, uh, 1 over nk multiplied, you see here it's a weighted value uh, out of the variance if you want that we get between each point and the mean of the current Gaussian. Uh, and again, it's, a, it's very similar. So, uh, of course, this one you get out of after computing the derivative, but it's pretty similar to what you get to the maximum likelihood. So the difference would be the same. The maximum likelihood is for something like 1 over n uh, divided, um, um, sorry, uh, multiplied with the sum, not divided, uh, out of xn minus mu k power 2. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it's again very similar. So instead of having of looking at the variance for all the point, points, we are computing the variance for all the points and the current centroid, but we are taking the variance into account only given by the weight of the responsibility. So again, it's uh, uh, it's pretty nice that we can see this link with maximum likelihood for only one Gaussian. And so now we have computed mu k, sigma k, we only have one set of parameters, p k. So we want to uh, maximize the log, li log likelihood with respect of p k. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or I know it's not really unfortunately, but uh, for p k we have an additional constraint. And when we want to uh, optimize with constraints, we need to add uh, a Lagrange multiplier, or this is called k k t conditions. Uh, uh, so the Lagrange multiplier says that the summation over all these values over all pk should be equal to one. Therefore, we add uh, a new parameter uh, lambda multiplied with uh, this constraint. And uh, now what we do, we compute the derivative. So we compute the derivative with respect with each individual pk, like p1, p2, up, up to the last one. And uh, actually, what we get, we get something like this. So for each value, we get something like this. Uh, and what we say over here, first we need to co compute which is a value for lambda, because otherwise we cannot compute the value for pk. And what we say, each of these values we multiply with pk. Uh, so we multiply first with p1, then with p2, and so on. Uh, and uh, actually, we're going to get something pretty interesting. We're going to have, so after multiplying and summing up, uh, we're going to get uh, something like a sum from n equal to 1 up to n out of 1 plus lambda multiplied with p1 and so on up to pn, up to, sorry, pk. 
it's equal to zero. So this is what we what we would get. Uh, how much is this summation P1 up to PK? These are the parameters of a multinomial distribution, so it should be equal to one. It's like together they form a multinomial distribution. So this should be equal to one. So actually what we get, we get the fact that uh, summing one n times, so n plus lambda is equal to zero. Therefore, lambda is equal to minus, mi minus n. Like if you want, you can uh, work this at home uh, uh, because I have uh, skipped one step. Uh, I, I have skipped the step here uh, in order to show you that it's actually really equal to one for each point after multiplying with PK um, and summing over all PKs, but uh, you, uh, you can trust me. So uh, lambda is equal to minus N uh, and then PK is going to get, the, uh, we're going to get to the fact that uh, PK uh, it's actually, uh, because w what we get, we're going to get something like this, we're going to get sum out of lambda of uh, z and k plus pk multiplied with lambda is equal to zero. Well, now we know that lambda is equal to uh, uh, minus n, therefore we're going to get that pk is going to be uh, sum out of all the responsibilities, gamma of z and k, uh, divided by n. And the sum of all, all the responsibilities uh, uh, is actually equal to nk. So the mixing coefficient pk, it's, if the, its interpretation uh, in English, like in normal words would be, is how much, how, how many points we have in, uh, generated by the case Gaussian divided by the total number of points. Like how important uh, in the current assignment, if you want, uh, is uh, uh, component k. Uh, cool, and it kind of makes sense, yeah. Uh, uh, and now we have computed all, all the three sets of parameters. So now, like we know PK, we know mu K, we know sigma K, and we say, Phew, we're done. And actually, we are not done. Like uh, these results do not constitute a closed form solution for the parameters of the mixture model because they depend on the, all of them depend on uh, gamma of Z and K. So depend on the responsibilities. Uh, and Actually, the responsibilities depend on th these parameters as well. So we need to f uh, we need to find uh, an iterative scheme in order to compute the solution. Uh, and uh, this is called the expectation maximization algorithm, this uh, uh, iterative scheme. So first we choose some initial values for the means, varieties, and, and mixing coefficients. Th they could be random or they could be chosen uh, a bit smarter. And then we alternate steps of E, steps and uh, m steps let's see what happens so expectation step we say we use a current par a par values for the parameters in order to compute the responsibilities so in the expectation step we say we use the current parameters mu sigma p in order to compute gamma uh, and then in the maximization step we use the values for gamma that are just computed in order to compute mu sigma p if you want new values for them and then we do, do this uh, iteratively. Uh, and what is guaranteed is guaranteed that each of these steps, E step and then M step and E step, uh, so E step individually is going to increase the log likelihood function. So E step is going to improve the log likelihood function. Uh, and after a number of steps, uh, this converges, again, it converges to a local optimum, it's similar to K-means, not to a global optimum. So maybe we should try several times. Uh, and for the same uh, 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 old faithful geyser data set, again, we start, like right now, we start with two Gaussians. Like these are the Gaussians. Uh, this is the blue mean. This is a red mean somewhere over here. Yeah, over here. Uh, and it's a simple covariance matrix uh, going the same in, uh, into all directions at the beginning. Uh, and this is where we have plus minus one variance. It's two dimensional Gaussians, yeah. Uh, and then is a, this is expectation step. What have we done is expectation step? What do we do? We color the points. Uh, actually, we say we compute the responsibility. So we color the points, meaning that we compute the responsibilities. Yeah. So here we have computed the responsibilities. We have colored the points into shades of blue and red. Uh, this is a maximization step. So 
we compute the new parameters of the model. So the new mean for the blue Gaussian, the new mean for the red Gaussian, and of course, you see now the covariance matrices have shifted, they are completely different. And uh, here again, one E and M step, here five uh, EM steps, and here 20 M steps, and uh, it, uh, we converge. Uh, cool. Uh, the expectation of maximization algorithms, uh, algorithm it's way more complex than a k-means for the same data set. So it takes more iteration in order to uh, converge, uh, but it can model more complex distributions. So it, uh, it should be able to uh, find a better uh, representation uh, of, of, of the original data. So uh, in order to improve this computation, one thing to do is first to run the k-means algorithm, which is faster. The k-means algorithm is going to provide some centroids. Uh, and actually, for each of these centroids, you can compute the covariance matrices for all the points in, this, in, in each individual uh, cluster. And then we start with this. So we start with the centroids as means for the Gaussians. We start with the uh, covariances of the clusters uh, as covariances for the Gaussians. And the mixing coefficients can be how many points we have assigned by k-means in, in each cluster. So this is a very good assignment to start uh, with k-means in order to uh, to improve like the uh, convergence of uh, EM algorithm. Cool. And now uh, ju just as a recap. So uh, as a recap, uh, we start with a Gaussian mixture model. Uh, like the number, we should know the number of k Gaussians. What we don't know, we don't know the parameters. And what we do, we initialize the parameters to some values, maybe using k-means, as uh, we have seen. And in the expectation step, we compute the responsibility, gamma of z and k. Like, how responsible is uh, the case Gaussian of generating each point x n? Uh, and this one is computed easily. Uh, it's in uh, theta uh, of n and k, like it's a matrix, if you uh, And then in the m step, we need to compute the new parameters the new, uh, for, for the model, like the new means, the new covariance matrices, and the new uh, mixing coefficients using uh, the formulas that you have just seen. Again, these are pretty simple to compute, it's just summation. And then we need to see, we compute the log likelihood function. So knowing the new parameters, compute which is the log likelihood. And if the log likelihood uh, has not changed, like we have reached the convergence criterion, or if it's changed only below a certain threshold, we stop. Otherwise, uh, if we don't re haven't reached convergence, we continue. Uh, cool. And uh, right now we have like introduced the expectation maximization algorithm for the particular case of Gaussian mixture models. We want to provide a more general view. So alternative and more general view of uh, expectation maximization algorithm. Uh, in this alternative view, we're going to explain a little bit why we need latent variables for uh, the expectation maximization uh, algorithm. So first, let's start with which is the goal. So the goal why we introduced this algorithm was to find maximum likelihood solutions for models where we have a latent variable involved. So. Uh, Let's say that right now we have several observed variables. X would be the same uh, set of observed variables, and several latent variables uh, z. And uh, theta is going to be the set of parameters that govern the model, like the parameter for all the observed and all the other latent variables. In our case, we had p, mu, and uh, uh, covariance matrices. Uh, and now we say what we want to compute. We want to, to compute the log likelihood uh, function for the observed variables alone, because this is what we are given. We are given only the, the observed variables. And we want to compute, like this is the likelihood, and we have the log likelihood uh, that we want to compute. But actually, the log likelihood, uh, you see, the logarithm acts on a summation. So if we have the complete data set, uh, the logarithm uh, acts now on a summation. So the presence, this presence of the summation makes computing the log likelihood more complicated. You, you have seen we can do it for the mixture of Gaussian model, but for other models, it's going to be more complex to do it uh, in algebraic method. And we'd like to find a better way. Like, uh, and this is like the expectation maximization, like the general uh, idea of expectation maximization. 
So what we say, we say, so X, uh, the full set, if, if, we, if we would have known for each uh, sample Xn of the latent variable Zn, this is called the complete data set. But actually we don't know, we only know the incomplete data set. Uh, but the, the good thing is that the, the likelihood function or the log likelihood function for the complete data set would be something like this. And you see now here the logarithm is applied directly directly on the uh, distribution. And if this distribution is a simple distribution, uh, then it's more simple to uh, to compute the log likelihood for the complete data set. So, so for the complete data set, the logarithm is applied directly on the distribution. Uh, and if this distribution is exponential, as it's in most cases, it's more simple to compute the log likelihood for the complete data set. But we actually don't know the complete data set. So, what can we do? So it's simpler to work with a complete data set, but we don't know the value for Z. And uh, what the expectation maximization algorithm in general says, it says, okay, we are not given, we don't know the complete data set, but we co can compute the best thing. So we don't know Z, but we can compute the best thing we have for Z. So instead of working with Z, so we, we don't know Z, we should work with the posterior distribution of the latent uh, variable. So we don't know which is a value for z corresponding to hx, but we can compute which is the posterior of z given the current points x and the current parameters. Um, cool. So instead of every time instead of working with z, we uh, now work under this uh, posterior distribution. Uh, and in the e step, we say that. Uh, uh, we use the posterior distribution uh, uh, like the expected value under the posterior distribution of the latent variable. And this is why it's called E step. So we don't know P of X and Z, but we use the expectation under uh, the posterior distribution of Z and theta. So uh, we don't know this value, but we, uh, we compute it under the posterior dis distribution. And this is called the expectation function. And this is the next step in the M step. We want to maximize this expectation function. Uh, and uh, uh, if the current estimate for the parameters, uh, when we start uh, one EM step is theta old, then after a step, a pair of uh, EM steps, we uh, have a new set of parameters, theta new. And uh, always the algorithm is, is initialized by some uh, uh, some uh, parameters, theta zero. Uh, and uh, we're going to look a little bit more why we use this expected value, uh, uh, the expectation of the posterior. Uh, so now let's look. Like this is a general view of expectation maximization. So we start with uh, some parameters uh, uh, theta zero. And now in the expectation step, we start with theta old, like it would be at the beginning theta zero in order to find the posterior distribution. So the posterior distribution in our case was the responsibility of Z. P of Z given X and theta old. Uh, and now we compute the, uh, expected, the expectation of the complete data log likelihood. So you see, you, ha you have the complete data log likelihood, uh, and now we multiply it with this expected value. Uh, and what we do, we, we marginalize over Z. So we don't know the value Z, therefore we marginalize Z out of this, uh, uh, out of this uh, expectation. Uh, Cool, and, and now you see, we have an advantage. Actually, the advantage when we work with this expectation function is the fact that actually the logarithm and the summation is like the interchange places. So if we don't work with the expectation, we have logarithm of a summation. Like if we work with the expectation, it's the summation of a logarithm applied on a probability distribution. So from a mathematical point of view, this is simpler to work with. So in the first step, we compute the expectation function, and then in the M step, we maximize this expectation. So we take the expectation, we maximize it by computing a new set of parameters. So you see now we have uh, the uh, expectation as the all parameters and some new parameters, and we want to uh, find out which are the new parameters uh, which maximize this expectation. 
uh, cool. So this is like the general case for uh, uh, the, uh, for expectation maximization algorithm, which doesn't work only for Gaussian mixture model. Uh, and it converges when the log, log likelihood function or the parameter values don't change or they change uh, little enough. So, um, cool. Um, some uh, remarks uh, here we say that if we have like if we have a, a prior for the parameters, we can also take into account, account this prior and add it to the uh, expectation. Like if we have some bias for the parameters to be in a specific set of uh, distribution functions, we can also add them to the expo uh, expectation uh, and we can work with this new function which needs to be maximized at this step. And now, so this is a general view. Now let's see how it uh, is applied for the mixture uh, of Gaussians. So we start at the beginning. What does it mean to have the complete data set? The complete data set is if we if we would have known for each xn also the corresponding uh, value zn, like the corresponding Gaussian function for which we sample from. If we would have known bo both of them, actually here the, uh, line, the the probability distribution would look like this. So it's a simple probability distribution. It's a double product. And uh, when we apply log li the log likelihood, so this is the likelihood, when we apply the logarithm, now the logarithm will apply on these two products, and it's going to be a double summation, and uh, again, the logarithm is going to go directly on the Gaussian function. So, like this would be the first observation. We said that, in general, for the joint distribution, the logarithm uh, is gonna uh, the log likelihood is gonna have a simpler formula, and we can see that in our case for the Gaussian mixture model, for the complete distribution, indeed the log likelihood is a very simple formula. Yeah, yeah. The logarithm goes just up to the exponential family uh, uh, distribution, like for, to each individual distribution. Uh, Cool. And uh, like uh, if we uh, look at the comparison between uh, the complete data set and the incomplete one, like the, the one that we need to maximize, we see that now the logarithm has changed places, like now it works directly on the uh, on the logarithm. Uh, and this uh, is much simpler uh, to, to compute uh, the values for mu, for uh, 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 like for mu, for sigma, and for the mixing coefficients. Uh, Cool. Uh, just a question. If we are given like the complete data set, these values Z and K, how do they act? Like uh, they are what kind of values? Like right now, these values Z and K, they are hard assignments because Z and K using is one out of K encoding. So it's a hard assignment. ZNK actually says the current poise XN, XN has been sampled from, I don't know, the third Gaussian. Therefore, uh, it's a hard assignment. Uh, cool. So now these are not responsibilities. They are hard, they should be hard assignments. And actually what we say now, if we can compute the maximum likelihood, the maximum likelihood looks something like, uh, like, like uh, it's going to look like the same uh, uh, in the case that we would have uh, a single Gaussian, but here instead of having n, is going to have only the points which are assigned to z Gaussian. So instead of having n, we're going to have like nk. And here instead of summing over all the points, we're going to sum only on the points which are assigned, uh, which were generated by the case Gaussian. Yeah, so it would look something like this. Uh, Cool. Uh, so it's very similar to the maximum likelihood for only one Gaussian, uh, but we only take into account the points which are actually generated by the corresponding the case Gaussian. And this is both for mu and for the covariance matrix. And for the mixing coefficients, again, it's going to be how many points from all the, all the points are in uh, are generated by the case Gaussian. So uh, it, 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 it makes sense. But actually, in practice, we don't have the values for the latent variable. So this would be simple if we would have the values for Z and K. But we don't have the values for Z and K. Therefore, in practice, we need to compute the posterior distribution for, for, for Z. So we need to compute P of Z given X and 
all the parameters. So these are all the parameters, theta. And actually, this posterior distribution is uh, the responsibility that we have uh, talked about. So gamma of z and k is what we need to compute. Uh, and now when we are revisiting, we say the expected value of the the expected value of the log of, of, of the log likelihood for the complete, so this is a log likelihood for the complete uh, data set. It's actually, uh, so you see what happens is the same way as uh, changing here instead of, so we don't know Z and K, but instead of uh, computing, instead of having Z and K, we, we put here the best that we have. Instead of putting Z and K, we, we put the responsibility of uh, Z and K. So it's a posterior distribution. So this is what happens over here. So we don't know Z and K, therefore instead of uh, Z and K, we put gamma of Z and K. And now actually this is the expectation, the expect, uh, expectation. So the expectation is similar to the complete uh, log likelihood. But instead of using with working with Z and K, actually here we put uh, gamma of Z and K. Uh, it's actually a motivation why we multiply uh, with the expected value. This is why we multiply with the expected value. This is what we actually get when we multiply with the expected value. Uh, and now what we need to do, we need so this is expectation. So in the expectation in the expectation step, we need to compute gamma. And now in the maximization step, we need to uh, compute the derivative in order to have the values for pk, mu k, and sigma k. And actually, we'll get the same values that we have gotten, uh, that we actually got uh, uh, a couple of slides ago, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, like these are the values if we compute the derivative, so they are the same. Uh, and th this would be uh, the m steps, the new parameters of the model. Um, cool. So this would be like EM in general, and uh, why the EM in general works for the Gaussian mixture model, and what happens for the uh, Gaussian mixture model. Uh, and now, just uh, like to finish, to uh, wrap up the discussion, let's see which is the relation between expectation maximization and k-means. So it's clear that we have a similarity. Uh, so we will, in both cases, we have some. Uh, uh, clusters or Gaussian distributions, uh, they have a mean, like they have mu k. Uh, they are different in the fact that uh, for expectation maximization, we also have covariances and we also have like the missing coefficients. And probably the most important fact is that e, uh, the EM uses a soft assignment. So at each step, we use the responsibilities, while the k means algorithm always uses a hard assignment of data points to, to, to clusters. And actually, we can derive the k-means algorithm. So k-means algorithm is a particular case of expectation maximization for mixture of Gaussians. Let's see which is this case. In which, what happens with the Gaussians to get uh, to k-means? So first, let's simplify, and we're going to say we simplify the model by using Gaussians that have simpler covariance matrices. So they, are, uh, they have a variance the same in all directions multiplied with the identity matrix. So always it's fixed. Uh, we only have this parameter uh, epsilon if you want. Uh, and epsilon is a variance parameter which is shared by all the components. So all the components have, uh, not only that we have this simpler covariance, but this variance parameter is the same for all the k components. So we don't have different uh, variances. We have the same variance for all components. And, and now let's see how the Gaussian lo looks like. So the Gaussian P of X for any component, uh, mu k and sigma k, now we, we, it's going to look something like this. If we, only, if we always have the same parameter epsilon. And now if we look at the responsibilities, so we take the, in the E step for EM, now the responsibility is going to look something like this. You, know, you see now we have uh, here uh, uh, the variance uh, epsilon. And what we see, consider what happens when epsilon goes to zero, like when we have a, a, a very small variance, variance goes to zero, a very high precision. 
If we have a very high precision, as the denominator actually uh, is a term for which we have the smallest distance, uh, will go to zero most, more slowly than all the other ones. Therefore, the responsibility for that point is going to be equal to one, and for all the other points, it's going to be equal to zero. So we're going to get a one out of k encoding. So uh, this happens independently of the values for the mixing coefficient. So actually, in this situation, uh, like if so, what 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 we said? We we said we have the same covariance, and not only that, we have the same covariance. The variances are very narrow. So these uh, Gaussian functions, these Gaussian probabilities, they are very precise. Like they act like a black hole if you want. They attract all the points which are closer to them. Uh, so in this situation, uh, the responsibility actually uh, becomes uh, one out of k encoding, and it actually transforms into R and k that we had for k means. Uh, and so this is for the E step. So in the E step, the responsibility transforms into a hard decision. And in the M step, when we compute, so now imagine this is how we compute the uh, uh, R and K. Uh, uh, now we need to compute the parameters uh, for the Gaussians. But which are the parameters? They are only the means because you see the variance now is fixed. It's fixed. It goes to zero. So epsilon, it goes to zero. This is a special case. So the only thing we need to compute is mu k. And now when we need compute mu k, it's actually the same formula that we had uh, uh, for, uh, for k means. So when the responsibility turns into one out of k encoding, the value for mu k you have seen, we have discussed, and Alex responded, uh, is the same one uh, that we had for k means. So actually, we have exactly the same algorithm. And now the only thing we need to think of, which is the link between the uh, expected value that we have, the expected log likelihood that we need to maximize, uh, and the error that we have for k means. And actually, in this situation where epsilon goes to zero, the expected value is going to look something like this. It's minus one multiplied with the error function. So it's minus one over two multiplied with the error function j from k means. So what we say, if we maximize the log likelihood for this expectation maximization in this specific case, is the same as minimizing, because here we have a minus now, minimizing the error for the k-means algorithm corresponding to it. So actually, this is a link. The k-means algorithm is a simple case where we have very uh, precise Gaussian with the same variance. So all the Gaussians have the same variance. It's a variance which is very as precise as possible. Precision goes to infinity, variance goes to zero. They act as black holes, if you want. Um, cool. This was today's, today's lecture. I hope uh, it was insightful. Uh, I know that you know about expectation maximization algorithm from uh, KRR. Uh, you have talked uh, like it has been a class this year. But I hope that you have found uh, some new information uh, in the uh, current lecture. Uh, yeah. Uh, is going to clear a, a little bit of the things up. Um, thank you, and uh, see you uh, next time. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Bye.